Καλώς ήρθατε στην ε, αποψινή, μάλλον αποψινή για την Ελλάδα, πρωινή για την Αμερική, ε, στον Κιλή Τράπεζα. Ευχαριστούμε πολύ ε, τους ε, κλεκτούς συναδέλφους που δέχτηκαν την πρόσκληση να συμμετάσχουν σήμερα στη Στρογγυλή Τράπεζα. Ε, προηγουμένως, να ανεβάσω πάλι την... Εδώ έχουμε τα ονόματα. Όπως γνωρίζετε, ε, συμμετέχουν ο καθηγητής Βασίλης Αγγελόπουλος από το UCLA στις Ηνωμένες Πολιτείες, ο συνάδελφος Γιάννης Δάνδουρας από το ΙΡΑΠ στην Τουλούζη της Γαλλίας, ο Θοδωρής Σωσαρής από το Δημοκρίτιο Πανεπιστήμιο Θράκης, η Ανεζίνα Σολομονίδου από το Καλτέκ των Ηνωμένων Πολιτειών και ο υποφαινόμενος ε, Γιάννης Δαγκλής από το Πανεπιστήμιο Αθηνών και το Ελληνικό Κέντρο Διαστήματος. Ε, όπως έχουμε ανακοινώσει, ε, αυτή η Στρογγυλή Τράπεζα στοχεύει σε, έχει τρία, τρεις άξονες ε, να μοιραστεί μαζί σας ε, κάποια, κάποιες πληροφορίες για τις ευθύνε και το όραμα του Ελληνικού Κέντρου Διαστήματος, να ε, μοιραστούν οι συνάδελφοι που έχουν τη σχετική εμπειρία μαζί σας ε, πληροφορίες σχετικές με τις δυνατότητες συμμετοχής σε αποστολές και σε όργανα της ε, αποστολών της ε, Ευρωπαϊκής Υπηρεσίας Διαστήματος και καθώς επίσης και να συζητήσουμε λίγο τις δυνατότητες, τις ευκαιρίες που υπάρχουν για επιστημονικές για επιστημονικά όργανα, για πειράματα επιστημονικά πάνω σε νανοδορυφόρους ή μικροδορυφόρους τις δυνατότητες και τα ωφέλη που μπορεί να έχει η επιστημονική κοινότητα από μια τέτοια συμμετοχή. Ευχαριστώ από καρδιά στους συναδέλφους που δέχτηκαν να πλαισιώσουν την εκδήλωση. Ενδεικτικά αναφέρω ποιοι συνάδελφοι θα μοιραστούν την εμπειρία τους μαζί μας ε, για τα επιμέρους θέματα. Θα ξεκινήσω με μια πολύ πολύ συνοπτική παρουσίαση του Ελληνικού Κέντρου Διαστήματος. Ε, ελπίζω πως αν υπάρχει κάποιος που δεν μιλάει ελληνικά ε, θα παρακαλούσα να με διακόψει γιατί πήρα φόρα και μιλάω ελληνικά ενώ εντάξει το outline είναι στα αγγλικά. Περιμένω λίγο μήπως και υπάρξει κάποια... Πρέπει να το πεις στα αγγλικά όμως, Γιάννη, γιατί Α, αλλιώς θα Έχετε δίκιο. Έχετε δίκιο. Uh, please, if there is anybody uh, who does not speak English, uh, raise their hand. Or speak out. Does not speak Greek. Who does not speak Tipa. <laughs> who does not speak Greek. <laughs> I guess there is nobody here who does not speak Greek. I see the names and they all seem Greek to me. But anyway, as I said to the panelists, they are free to speak English or Greek, no problem. I just started in, uh, in Greek. And let me uh, very quickly continue with uh, the brief presentation of the Hellenic Space Center. So this is uh, the website of the Hellenic Space Center. If you just Google the name, you will find that the website. And uh, I would say that uh, the main responsibility, well, one of the main responsibilities of the Hellenic Space Center is to assist uh, the Greek government in the development of a national space policy, which is lacking, still lacking, and of a corresponding action plan in collaboration with the academic and research community and uh, the wider public and private sector. So for this, we have uh, initiated a consultation a few months ago. Many of you uh, were addressed and provided feedback. And uh, based on this consultation, we uh, have delivered to the ministry uh, the a proposal for the national space policy. Εδώ θα μου επιτρέψετε να κάνω switch πάλι στα ελληνικά. Προτείναμε λοιπόν, έχουμε στείλει στο Υπουργείο, έχουμε υποβάλει στον Υπουργό Ψηφιακή Διακυβέρνηση την πρότασή μα για του πυλώνε τη εθνική διαστημική πολιτική που του βλέπουμε εδώ. Διαβάζω έτσι πολύ γρήγορα. Ενίσχυση τη εθνική άμυνα και τη πολιτική προστασία. Ενίσχυση τη εθνική οικονομία. Επιδίωξη των στόχων του ΟΗΕ για τη βιώσιμη ανάπτυξη και τη χρήση του διαστήματο προ όφελο τη ανθρωπότητα. Αυτό είναι ένα παγκόσμιο πυλώνα, θα λέγαμε, δεν αφορά μόνο την Ελλάδα. 
αλλά υπάρχει στα, σε, στα κείμενα εθνικής διαστημικής πολιτικής πολλών χωρών. Ε, αυτό που, θεωρώ, που θεωρούμε ότι ενδιαφέρει την ΕΛΑΣΕΤ και ε, γενικότερα την επιστημονική κοινότητα είναι η ενίσχυση της επιστημονικής αριστείας και η συμβολή στην επιστημονική έρευνα και την τεχνολογική ανάπτυξη. Ε, κεντρική ευθύνη είναι η υποστήριξη της πολιτείας σε θέματα διακυβέρνησης και λειτουργίας της δημόσιας διοίκησης και προσφορά ολοκληρωμένων διαδορυφορικών υπηρεσιών υψηλής ποιότητας τόσο στον πολίτη όσο και στις επιχειρήσεις. Ανάπτυξη εθνικών ικανοτήτων είναι αυτό που ονομάζουμε capacity building και ανάσχεση της διαρροής έμψυχου δυναμικού. Και τέλος, ενίσχυση της εξωστρέφειας και της διεθνούς παρουσίας της Ελλάδας. Ε, αυτούς τους πυλώνες, είναι 7 πυλώνες λοιπόν, 7 πυλώνες για την διαστημική πολιτική. Έχουμε ε, προτείνει στο Υπουργείο και μετά ε, υπάρχουν και μία σειρά προτινόμενων δράσεων, οι οποίες είναι πάρα πολλές, είναι περίπου 20, δεν θα αναφερθώ σε όλες αυτές. Ε, θα επιλέγω μόνο κάποιες οι οποίες θεωρώ ότι ενδιαφέρουν. Ε, βλέπω κάποιο σχόλιο σε chat. Α, μάλιστα, έχουμε έναν... Οκ. Okay. Οκ. Okay. Thank you, Πάκο. I see that we have at least one non-Greek speaker. Uh, As I said before, please speak out and let me know if you don't uh, speak English. So what I am currently uh, uh, presenting here is uh, a plan for the national space policy of Greece and some, uh, a number of uh, suggested uh, activities. So uh, please, uh, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, Bear with me, I, I want to finish this part. This is uh, only a very small part. I will finish it in, uh, in Greek and then we will continue everything else in, uh, in English, okay? So, λοιπόν, uh, όσον αφορά το στρατηγικό σχέδιο δράσεων, λοιπόν, αυτά που έχουμε uh, προτείνει και είναι, σχετίζονται, θα έλεγα, με την κοινότητά μας, τουλάχιστον σε κάποιο βαθμό, είναι η συντονισμένη διαχείριση των διαστημικών δραστηριοτήτων της χώρας, ο σχεδιασμός, η ανάπτυξη και η υλοποίηση ενός εθνικού προγράμματος παρουσίας στο διάστημα μέσω launch on demand. Αυτό είναι πολύ σημαντικό, αν μπορέσουμε να το πετύχουμε, διότι κάνει την συμμετοχή σε διαστημικά προγράμματα οικονομικά βιώσιμη, θα έλεγα, και επίσης δημιουργία μιας ολοκληρωμένης επίγειας υποδομής, πολύ σημαντικό και λίγο πιο στοχευμένα, που θα έλεγα ότι ενδιαφέρει την κοινότητά μας, είναι η δημιουργία στοιχείων επίγειας υποδομής σε πανεπιστήμια σε σύνδεση με προγράμματα σπουδών σχετικά με το διάστημα. Η αλήθεια είναι ότι αυτή τη στιγμή τα προγράμματα σπουδών που έχουμε ε, με σύνδεση με το διάστημα είναι σχετικά περιορισμένα. Υπάρχουν δύο προγράμματα μεταπτυχιακών σπουδών και ένα τμήμα για προπτυχιακές σπουδές. Ε, αλλά υπάρχουν ωστόσο και αν θα μπορούσαμε να πετύχουμε κάποιες επίγειες υποδομές, δηλαδή σταθμούς λήψης δεδομένων σε πανεπιστήμια που να συνδέονται και με τα προγράμματα σπουδών, θεωρώ ότι θα ήταν πολύ μεγάλο όφελος για τους αυριανούς επιστήμονες. Και αυτή είναι η τελευταία μου διαφάνεια, η υποστήριξη συνεργειών ακαδημαϊκής έρευνας και ιδιωτικής πρωτοβουλίας. Αυτό είναι πάρα πολύ σημαντικό σημείο η συνέργεια του ακαδημαϊκού χώρου με την ιδιωτική πρωτοβουλία είναι προϋπόθεση ειδικά όσον αφορά την ενίσχυση της εθνικής οικονομίας. Και επίσης είναι, θα έλεγα, απαραίτητη για την εμπλοκή μας σε διαστημικά προγράμματα και αυτό εκτιμώ ότι θα το αναφέρουν και οι συνάδελφοι οι συνάδελφοι που συμμετέχουν στο πάνελ είναι η εμπειρία και όλων των, χωρό, των χωρών αυτών που έχουν ε, ισχυρές, ε, σημαντικές δραστηριότητες ε, σε αυτό τον τομέα. Ε, οπωσδήποτε θέλουμε να δώσουμε κίνητρα και ευκαιρίες για τη συμμετοχή νέων επιστημόνων σε εθνικά και διεθνή διαστημικά προγράμματα. Στόχος είναι ε, να ε, πετύχουμε ανάσχεση της διαρροής έμψυχου δυναμικού και δι' αυτού την ενίσχυση της εθνικής οικονομίας. Και, και τέλος, 
να ενισχύσουμε το, ανθρώπινο, το υφιστάμενο ανθρώπινο δυναμικό, καθώς επίσης και τις υφιστάμενες υποδομές ε, που υπάρχουν ήδη σε πανεπιστήμια και ερευνητικά κέντρα ε, και να αναπτύξουμε και νέες υποδομές. Λοιπόν, αυτά τα λίγα ήθελα να πω για το Ελληνικό Κέντρο Διαστήματος, τις ευθύνε του και το όραμα που έχει. Ε, και θα έλεγα... Ε, να σημειώνουμε ίσως καλύτερα τις ερωτήσεις που έχουμε για το τέλος. Αν υπάρχει δηλαδή κάτι που θα θέλατε να διευκρινίσουμε, να, ε, να το συζητήσουμε στο τέλος. Ε, οπότε το δεύτερο μέρος της ε, Στρογγυλής Τράπεζας αφορά τη δυνατότητα εμπλοκής συμμετοχής ε, Ελλήνων επιστημόνων, ελληνικών ομάδων σε προγράμματα της ΕΣΑ και με αυτή τη συμμετοχή και εμπλοκή ενώ αναφέρουμε βέβαια σε αποστολές, δηλαδή εμπλοκή συμμετοχή σε διαστημικές αποστολές της ΕΣΑ, είναι, θα έλεγα, ένα από τα μεγάλα πλεονεκτήματα που προσφέρει η συμμετοχή μας στην European Space Agency, η δυνατότητα δηλαδή να συμμετέχουμε σε τέτοιες αποστολές, η οποία θα έλεγα ότι είναι μάλλον... Ε, δεν την έχουμε εκμεταλλευτεί ίσως αρκετά ακόμη. Ε, οπότε θα ήθελα να δώσω το λόγο πρώτα στον ε, Γιάννη το Δάνδουρα, ο οποίος ε, θεωρώ ότι έχει, είναι από τους συναδέλφους που έχει πολύ πλούσια εμπειρία από ε, διαστημικές αποστολές της ΕΣΑ, να μας πει έτσι λίγα λόγια για την εμπειρία του. Ευχαριστώ πολύ Γιάννη. And thank you for giving us this possibility to discuss this uh, very important issue for the future of the, uh, Greece and how it can be involved in the ESA programs. Uh, in order to launch the discussion, I will just show two view graphs. Let me just try to share my screen. Okay. okay. So I will start uh, 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 with what is the science program of ESA in the first slide. Actually, it's a series of missions. I'll just speak first of all of the Cosmic Vision program, which is the program which is uh, uh, currently operating. We have several classes of missions, small class, medium class, large class, or fast class. I'm not going to get into the details for each mission because the information is uh, easily available at the internet so everybody can uh, find it and discuss it just to have a, a vision of, uh, of this program. Uh, and then also we have missions of opportunity. The next step of this program will be uh, uh, the Voyage 2050 where already from last year there was a call for ideas and some large uh, themes were identified as for example moons of, of the giant planets or uh, uh, characterizing exoplanets but the most important issue i would like to discuss uh, today is how these missions are selected and how the nation can participate in these missions so The missions, this, uh, these missions come from proposals from the scientific community. Uh, uh, typically for a medium class uh, uh, missions, there can be, when there is a call, there can be about 50 proposals just to give a typical number. And then there's a series of evaluations by, the, uh, by ESA, by the thematic working groups. They select some of them. And then uh, there is a, a refinement and finally, uh, Each time there is one mission after its call that's selected by the science program committee. These calls do not come very often. Uh, uh, the last uh, medium class mission, the M5, was about uh, uh, five years ago, and we don't know yet whether there will be a next one and when it will be. Now, once a mission is selected, what happens is that the is that ESA supplies the spacecraft which is built by industry after of course selective uh, 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 selection of competition from uh, 
and selection of industry, and then ESA supplies the space operations. However, the science instruments, and here is the opportunity to, uh, uh, to grasp, they are not supplied directly by ESA, but they are supplied by research institutes in the uh, countries, members of ESA. And the principle is that uh, uh, when an institute proposes an instrument, it has to be funded by its national space agency. And there is usually there are large consortia that are formed to build a given instrument. And there's the principle of non-transfer of funds. Each nation is funding its own participation. Now, before ESA selects an instrument, it requires from the National Space Agency an endorsement. That's a statement that if the mission is selected, if the instrument is selected, we're going to fund it. Now, usually ESA wishes to have what we say what we would say a hard endorsement that's a firm commitment. Usually national space agencies do not supply a hard endorsement, but a soft endorsement. That's yes, we are aware of this proposal which comes from our national community. We are uh, considering it. And then in case it is selected, uh, 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 we'll do whatever we can in, in, in order uh, to uh, uh, support financial, but there is no firm commitment. And the reason is but, uh, because the proposals usually have, when added together, they have a budget that goes well above what a national space age can fund, but all, we know that all of, not all of them will be selected. And also, so uh, there is a kind of soft uh, 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 commitment. Now, the national space agencies, in order to supply this endorsement, what they do, this is not the rule, it, it changes from country to country, is that they ask their uh, 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 institutes that are participating in a mission to send prior to submission to ESA a copy of the proposal, which is evaluated and goes under review. Usually it's not a very deep review, but it's, uh, let us say, a first review in order to evaluate the proposal, its feasibility, and the level that can be supported. So now it's up to each spa national space agency to uh, organize this procedure. So uh, uh, the, the advantage is that it gives the possibility to participate to uh, uh, very large international programs, and it is uh, a boost both for the research institutes, but also for the industry, because the instruments usually they are, are built by combining the forces of a research institute and of a national industry that builds a, a parts of the uh, instrument. But of course, it requires some funding. Now, that what happens with the pure science program. But I would like to go to my next view graph, where we discuss the human and robotic exploration program, which is a program is between science, research, uh, human exploration, robotics, applications, exploration of space. So I just, uh, I'm just giving a, a, a few examples, the deep space gateway or lunar gateway, which will be the uh, uh, a future international space station in orbit around the moon to support the Artemis program of exploration of the moon, but it will also supply a platform for scientific instruments. EL3, which its counterpart on the lunar surface, EL3 stands for European uh, 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 lunar uh, large uh, lander. It will be a robotic spacecraft that would land on the moon and supply uh, uh, instrumentation for a lunar exploration that in order to assist human exploration, but also have autonomous. ExoMars uh, that uh, uh, combines both uh, a space of trace gas orbit and also a, a rover that uh, 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 is, is going to, uh, 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 to study traces of eventual past alive. And then the Mars Sample Return Mission, which is a very big international endeavor, participation between NASA, ESA. It involves several missions. The first mission 
is, is now the Perseverance rover that started a recently its exploration of Mars and is going to, to see, select samples. The samples will be put in a canister. Then ESA will send a, a rover that's going to collect the canisters, the, the, the fetch rover. It will going to bring them to another space. And then the other space that's going to launch these uh, uh, samples for return to Earth. And then, of course, we should mention the International Space Station. Now, what's the main difference concerning the organization of this mission with respect to the science program? Actually, ESA, of course, applies the spacecraft and the space operations, but the main difference is that here, ESA purchases science instruments through invitations to tender. That's when a research institute has to supply an instrument, it does not need to seek funding from its national space agency, but ESA purchases the, uh, 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 the instruments through industrial type contracts for the institutes. Usually in this case, an institute has uh, 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 to uh, collaborate with some industry because industry is better organized in order to respond to such kinds of invitation of tender with more of an industrial uh, nature. And then somehow the institute uh, 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 is a subcontractor to the industry that's going to supply the instruments. Now, uh, usually national agencies are also in the loop, but the level of funding that's requested by the institutes of the national space agency is not of the level to build an instrument, but to uh, to, for, the, for all the science support that goes, uh, that goes around. So this is uh, a new window that gives uh, the opportunity to participate in large missions that are, let us say, the future of, ma of mankind when we speak about going to the moon and exploring Mars and things uh, uh, like that without having to load heavily the national uh, uh, budget. And also a similar way operates to the Earth Exploration Program about which Thodoris will speak uh, uh, later. So this is just some introduction just to launch the, the discussion. Thank you very much, Yanni. That was uh, very uh, useful, especially the part, the second part that distinguishes the human spaceflight and robotic exploration program from the usual uh, way uh, the science program works. Uh, so may I ask uh, Anezina Solomonidou maybe to share some uh, insights uh, from her experience with uh, ESA projects? Sure. Um, hi to everyone. I won't share my screen. I'll just uh, I'll just share some words. So I have worked at ESA for uh, three years, up until the end of 2020, and I currently participate in one of the missions that uh, Yanis Dandur has presented before, and that's ESA's L-class mission, the, the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, or as we call it, JUICE. And this mission was built and is being operated by ESA with participation from several of uh, ESA member states. Now, I think that it's uh, very important for Greece to participate in ESA's various activities and uh, more significantly to contribute with hardware for the missions. Now, um, Yanis just before me talked about ESA's program and described the opportunities offered there very nicely. Um, but I just want to mention again that ESA not only consists of the Directorate of Science, of the science program, uh, the center of which is at um, ISAC in Madrid, where I was also working, but also the uh, Human and Robotic Exploration, or uh, HRE, and the Earth Observations Directorate. Now, uh, as Yanni said, uh, HRE manages the ISS as well as the exploration of the Moon and Mars. And uh, Earth Observations manages uh, all of the Earth observations, communications, climate and meteorology, and so on and so forth. Of course, there are different ways to contribute to ESA as a member state. Um, the contribution to the Science Directorate, for instance, is mandatory as per the defense uh, growth uh, partnership of each country. And what that does is that it gives uh, the member state access to many opportunities for missions and uh, also for science through competitive calls for instruments and participating scientists. 
Now, the contribution to the human and robotic exploration is optional, and each country can contribute what they like. And I think that given that the Hellenic Space, Space Center will uh, focus on related activities in the coming years, that is a great chance to contribute to ISIS program. Now, to contribute to the Earth observations is also optional, but here Greece has expertise with uh, weather satellites and can also contribute to communications uh, and many other aspects. Um, what I, I personally find important for Greece's case, based on the aspirations also pr uh, presented by Yanis Daglis for the Hellenic Space Center, is the need for Greece to be present as a delegate in all ESA programs and also uh, in parallel programs in a sense, like the one offered by the EU, the European Union Horizon Europe, which is a key program for research and innovation with a budget that is almost 100 billion euros. Now, what that program does is that gives a, a small country like Greece uh, the opportunity to participate in large programs through a, a small contribution of money. And in our case, it will give uh, Greek scientists the opportunity to be part of the larger picture, in a sense. Um, something I forgot to mention about the SI, uh, the, um, the science program, is that there are missions of opportunity where uh, ESA is the partner of choice for international cooperation, to which also Greece can contribute. And to give an example, these are the Japanese and the Chinese missions, and there are many more. Now, as Yanis uh, Dambouras mentioned, as of recently, the review of the CDR committee of ESA's Voyage 2050, which is the long-term planning of the ESA science program, um, has completed its work. And a report has been submitted to the ESA Director of Science detailing the committee's final recommendations. Um, and the report was very interesting. So ESA's large class science uh, missions for the time frame of 2035 to 2050 will focus on moons of the giant solar system planets. Personally, I'm uh, investing a lot into that part as a planetary geologist and a planetary scientist. Also, the temperate exoplanets of the galactic ecosystem, and uh, also new physical probes of the early universe. So, what I, I suggest as a final note is that, you know, let's start dreaming big and aspire for participation in these missions. And let's start working towards this as an ESA member state by being present in ESA's activities and programs um, as much as possible. So that's thank what you. I wanted to share. Thank you, Anazina. Thank you very much. And uh, let us uh, move to uh, Thodoris Saris, uh, who has a significant experience as a, a PI of a proposal of a space mission. Uh, but in the framework of the Earth Observation Directorate, actually. And this is a very interesting aspect, I would say, because it is uh, different from what we usually perceive as uh, space science missions. Uh, Thodori, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Thank you Yanis. Bring up. Uh... Pick up a few slides and I will um, focus not so much on the mission itself, but on um, as the uh, scope of uh, this roundtable is on, on uh, lessons learned um, and what it takes. Uh, so, so um, Daedalus, uh, as uh, Janis mentioned, and I hope you can see my uh, primary screen. Yes. Okay. Uh, as Yanis uh, mentioned, it uh, was proposed to uh, Earth, ESA's Earth Observation Program, which has uh, has proven to be uh, both a challenge and an opportunity. Um, as Anezina uh, mentioned, uh, Earth Observation is accustomed to 
uh, remote sensing observations of the Earth uh, system, uh, uh, focusing on, on, on climate and other aspects. And uh, Daedalus is a mission that um, uh, targets to uh, sample in situ uh, the uh, how, uh, as it's stated here, how our atmosphere interacts with the, uh, with the space. And that has is a great opportunity as uh, it, it's um, uh, as always uh, interdisciplinarity um, uh, shows or reveals uh, aspects uh, that uh, uh, are uh, offer innovative science and new exploration. Um, and that has been um, has led to the uh, selection of uh, Daedalus as uh, one of uh, three uh, Earth Explorer ideas selected in. Uh, ESA's Earth Observation Program for the uh, Earth Explorers. Um, it was selected in uh, 2018, and uh, we have uh, conducted the um, requirements and uh, science consolidation uh, study over the past um, years. Uh, in brief, uh, Daedalus uh, targets uh, to sample in situ the region uh, where um, uh, charged particles, plasmas, uh, fields from the magnetosphere uh, interact via collisions with the uh, upper atmosphere. And uh, as shown here, this leads to uh, intense uh, uh, currents uh, that um, uh, heat up uh, the upper atmosphere of the dual heating, as is shown in this uh, oversimplified cartoon. cartoon. Um, and most of the processes uh, uh, targeted by Daedalus have been um, only sampled uh, uh, by uh, remote sensing, by radars from the ground, or by uh, satellites from above that focus on the upper part of this uh, current system. But the actual closure of the current system within the region where neutrals and, at, and, 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 and uh, charged particles uh, and plasmas interact has never been sampled. And as shown is in this cartoon of, uh, of the uh, simple uh, resistance uh, figure here, uh, it is the uh, interactions of uh, moving neutral winds uh, uh, together with the uh, uh, ions uh, that are needed to resolve the actual uh, joule heating that uh, uh, goes on. And together with that, one needs to know uh, conductivity, uh, fields, uh, constituents, uh, uh, collision cross-sections, collision frequencies, and a number of, uh, um, uh, of, of measurements that need to be sampled in situ. So uh, Daedalus uh, uh, proposed uh, Daedalus uh, um, proposed a fully uh, instrumented satellite with uh, uh, measuring neutrals, winds, ions, fields, particles, uh, and uh, uh, on, proposed also the deployment of uh, miniaturized uh, payloads uh, to sample uh, at, at different locations uh, or at, alternatively a twin satellite mission that can resolve uh, uh, spatial and temporal uh, variations, as well as uh, altitude profiles of uh, key processes. Um, what it um, uh, took, or a significant part of this phase, was uh, to simulate extensively uh, the uh, measurement concept. And uh, uh, this includes uh, orbits, uh, sampling global models, and uh, demonstrating exactly what Daedalus is going to achieve. And this is uh, shown in this uh, uh, animation based on global simulations of how Daedalus will sample temperatures, uh, winds, drifts, uh, electric fields, uh, and densities uh, along an elliptical orbit that uh, uh, at its lowest uh, point uh, at, it, uh, at, at perigee uh, manages to reach this uh, unreachable uh, up to now. Uh, uh, region, which has only been sampled by uh, rockets. Uh, so demonstrations uh, at the, the proposal stage uh, during the um, uh, uh, requirements consolidation is a key aspect um, and also a very important aspect uh, in the Earth Observation uh, Program uh, uh, overall. Um, uh, another thing it uh, took, uh, due to the large amount of uh, instrumentation, expertise, the uh, space-atmosphere interaction was a, a, a large team uh, that has always uh, that has uh, that has also proven to be both a challenge and a great opportunity. Uh, there's expertise uh, from a number of institutes and from another, uh, a number of uh, countries. 
uh, as shown here in the uh, logos of the participating institutes led by the Democritus University of uh, Thrace. Um, another part that um, uh, we put a lot of emphasis is uh, uh, showing uh, worldwide uh, support and excitement about the mission. And, and uh, we did that via uh, various ways, uh, workshops, uh, 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 roundtables, uh, um, uh, participation in conferences, and especially what is shown here, uh, data usage uh, survey, where, where, where we uh, try to reach out and, and, and ask the community how Daedalus would impact their science, how Daedalus data would be used, and, and an overwhelming response uh, uh, was uh, showed uh, um, that uh, Daedalus data would be used in a lot of uh, areas, such as model validation, ingestion in the models, uh, case studies, uh, etc. Um, so, um, uh, the status uh, is that we have currently, uh, we have uh, completed successfully the uh, science and requirements consolidation. Uh, that was uh, commended uh, as uh, uh, a most innovative exploration mission proposal, even amongst the, uh, the three candidate uh, missions. Um, uh, However, it was assessed uh, to uh, exceed the, the currently exceed as specified to exist the cost cap, which was uh, uh, 40 million, including a launch as well as the timing constraints of the uh, Earth Explorer uh, program. Uh, however, uh, ESA strongly recommended uh, uh, to continue the risking activities and maturity studies and mature uh, further the Daedalus uh, mission concept. Uh, as well as uh, uh, is, is uh, exploring international cooperation between uh, mostly with uh, NASA, where there's a lot of uh, expertise from the early years of the atmosphere explorers in a number of uh, instruments. Um, and also uh, uh, synergies of uh, Daedalus with the upcoming uh, NASA's geospace dynamic constellation is something that um, uh, also strengthens this collaboration of uh, e between ESA and NASA, where, whereby uh, GDC uh, aims to uh, sample this region up above at 300 to 400 kilometers, and then Daedalus uh, will be sampling down below, uh, all the way down to 120 uh, kilometers, which is the targeted perigee uh, altitude. Um, and, and more information you can find on our uh, website. Um, so, um, what um, a few comments on what it takes. Uh, uh, Daedalus had uh, uh, very simple and straightforward uh, science objectives and requirements targeting to uh, measure uh, specific uh, uh, derived quantities such as conductivity, joule heating, uh, things that uh, are um, achievable uh, given uh, the full suite of uh, instrumentation. Um, uh, a demonstration, as I mentioned, of the, of the closure of the science objectives is uh, key. And this took uh, uh, extensive mission simulators. Um, it's uh, important uh, and very, very uh, helpful if uh, already at the proposal stage, there's first preliminary results of the, uh, of the demonstration of the, or, or even if preliminary. And that's uh, the, the course we, do, we took in Daedalus by running simulations, proposing Daedalus and then expanding uh, the, uh, uh, simulations via um, uh, simulations that include, included quantifying the uh, Daedalus objectives over the mission lifetime. Uh, a demonstration of impacts uh, is also extremely important, uh, the relation to societal and, and scientific benefits, as well as, uh, as I mentioned, uh, support from the wider scientific community. And um, I will uh, leave it at that for a few. Conclusions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Todori. Um, I would suggest, uh, uh, since we have uh, completed the second, um, the second topical uh, area, so to speak, the second uh, item of our agenda, maybe uh, it might be worthwhile to take uh, questions to our uh, three colleagues who discussed participation in ESA missions. And maybe I would, uh, Thodori, I would like just to, uh, for me to remember and also to clarify to our colleagues, um, we 
most of us are more familiar with the calls of the science directorate. Uh, you know, there are calls for, uh, pro for uh, mission proposals. And then after a mission is selected, there are calls for instruments. How did it work in, uh, in the case of Earth observation? Uh, so it's a, it's a similar uh, process. Uh, the um, Earth Explorer program uh, solicits a, a call uh, for a mission that's um, uh, approximately every uh, two years. So the, the, the goal is to have one Earth Explorer launched every uh, two years. Um, Swarm was a, a, a prime example of uh, uh, the Earth Explorer program, uh, which um, uh, even though it sampled uh, remotely the uh, magnetic field, the crustal fields uh, of the Earth, it also had an in situ component that was very important. Um, and that uh, uh, also helped pave the way for, for, for Daedalus. Uh, so when the Earth, uh, uh, um, when, when a mission is uh, uh, selected for uh, a phase zero study, a, a mission advisory group is uh, formed that uh, steers the mission. Um, Yanis uh, Danduras was part of the Daedalus mission advisory group. Uh, and can, can further comment on, on that. And at the same time, there's a, a, a science uh, team that investigates the science aspects and then um, industrial consortia that compete for the implementation uh, of uh, the mission. Um, so there's opportunities for the uh, uh, scientific uh, community and also uh, instrument or component providers to team up uh, with, with uh, these teams. Um, a main difference from the science directorate is that uh, Earth observation funds the entire mission, so uh, all instruments. There's no uh, national uh, participation, which uh, is also, as uh, everything, a challenge and an opportunity. Uh, it, it's um, uh, having to go after uh, all um, uh, national teams to secure funding from a number of uh, national agencies has its uh, uh, challenges, uh, but also uh, provides uh, 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 more flexibility in terms of uh, uh, going towards the specific expertise that the PI can find. Uh, whereas uh, uh, in the Earth Observation Program, uh, it's often that uh, industry takes up this uh, role uh, with, with, uh, with uh, some challenges that have proven uh, uh, at times uh, important for Daedalus as well. That's a very interesting difference, of course. Yes, indeed. Um, so the, the, the very first step uh, to get involved in such an activity is to either have a great idea yourself and to, and to gather and to, to team up with uh, uh, international colleagues, other colleagues, right, the way you did it, or alternatively to, uh, to look for opportunities of uh, proposals that are being prepared by other teams and to join these teams. Teams, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Angelos Burlidas, uh, let me see, I think I have uh, to, I'm not sure if you, oh, you can, okay, fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, no, I want to emphasize here to the next step for what you just said, that uh, <clears throat> it's good to have good ideas and all that, but there has to be a plan. And I think what, um, because the, the ideas have to kind of channel, there has to be some top level organization in all this, like we do in the States with our uh, surveys every 10 years where we develop the 10 year plan. And then from then on, we can develop a, a five year to 10 year roadmap. And that's where this roadmap kind of consolidates what the community say in the heliophysics or planetary wants to do which helps us, the instrument uh, providers, to think of what is important, what measurement is important. Like uh, Daedalus, for example, is going after that, the closure of the currents, which also is a very important measurement in the NASA uh, side. So that will help someone to think, you know, not to maybe waste their time in, in things that are maybe peripheral to what the overall Greek community wants or what also the capabilities of the local industry are. Also, we have to to get started, maybe we want to focus or take advantage what we already have so that we can, you know, jumpstart our uh, participation. Yeah, uh, thank you, Angela, for this. But uh, 
Yanni, uh, Yanis Danduras, uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken, something similar happens also in the, on the ESA level, right? I mean, we also have uh, a plan of uh, something like a decade, right? Yes, exactly. Actually, uh, the Cosmic Vision program before that was Horizon 2000, now Voyage 2050. So it's a long term program. Initially, it starts by identifying broad lines of science objectives. Then there are call of missions for missions. And there is usually uh, 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 some care about having a good balance between a different. Uh, 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 thematics between, for example, astrophysics, planetology, alias physics, and things like that, and and then they go down to to mission level. If I can just mention that uh, the the way the ESA Voyage twenty fifty functions is is it is in a sense correlated to what the NASA Decadal Survey does for. Uh, for the US. So I, I think we can connect those two. Uh, okay. Yes, so uh, the, uh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, an excellent point that Agilus uh, and Zin and Yanis raised that, um, uh, that the, all missions have to uh, address one of the existing uh, goals of uh, decadal surveys in the long term plans over. Earth observations uh, program that was ESA's living planet program and, and, and uh, a key part is to demonstrate and, and show how you fit within the specific objectives of the plan. Uh, now, um, uh, with respect to uh, Aguilos' comments, uh, uh, NASA's way of doing decadal surveys is extremely uh, interesting and we, we reach out to the wider community uh, for providing ideas and then um, assigning uh, panels to uh, condense and consolidate these is, is uh, I think something that, that that's not uh, parallel to ESA at least at this point or, or I didn't, yeah, maybe that's my impression that um, that's uh, uh, a key aspect that the, uh, the, the recent heliophysics 2050 uh, meeting in, in uh, NASA was, was um, um, uh, attended uh, widely and uh, it was an impressive uh, community effort. It was really uh, something. And, and as a last comment, um, it's uh, with respect to ESA's effort to uh, uh, team up and, and, and um, uh, cooperate with NASA, on, specifically on Daedalus. Uh, we were uh, urged both by uh, ESA and NASA side to make sure that um, the number of white papers going out uh, uh, and shaping up right now uh, should specifically uh, address uh, uh, Daedalus-related uh, objectives, science objectives, and mission objectives. So, it's, uh, so we're, we're, we're working towards, towards that as well with uh, partnerships with uh, members in the US that are forming up uh, white papers and participating in the decadal survey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thodori. Uh, there is a question in the chat box by uh, uh, Dr. Solomos. Uh, he's asking uh, whether uh, regarding non-science initiatives, which one of the two local agencies is responsible for representing Greece in ESA decision-making boards, the Hellenic Space Center or the National Committee of Astronomy? Well, uh, for the time being, none of the two, I have to say, uh, because uh, uh, since uh, 2017, I think, uh, you know, the, uh, in 2017, there was a national law which gave this uh, responsibility to the Ministry of Digital Governance uh, and uh, in uh, September last year, there was a new law that uh, made a modification that modified uh, the terms of reference and uh, um, has created a new delegation uh, in which a new ESA delegation, so to speak, in which uh, the Hellenic Space Center uh, contributes. But this law has not yet uh, put into, how do we say, there, uh, it still needs uh, a ministerial decree to be implemented 
which means that uh, for the time being, uh, the, the Greek rep representation in ESA, uh, in ESA boards is still with the Ministry of Digital Governance. We do hope that in the near future, the Hellenic Space Center will uh, be part of the delegation. So this is the, the answer. And this covers everything. It, does, it, does, it covers both science and non-science uh, issues, uh, technology issues or space applications. I mean, it covers really uh, all activities of ESA. So this is the answer to this question. And uh, I don't see, for the time being, I don't see any other question. Uh, but please feel free to, uh, to uh, uh, type questions in the chat box or raise your hand if there is anything else. So I would then proceed to the third part, uh, which relates to, um, uh, to an activity, to a national activity that uh, we have been envisioning. Uh, you probably have heard or have read about uh, the microsatellite program of uh, the, the national microsatellite program of uh, the Greek government, uh, which uh, is uh, planned to be implemented over the next few years uh, with uh, a, a budget that is uh, for Greek standards uh, pretty significant, I would say, uh, more than 100 million uh, euros. Uh, the focus of this uh, uh, microsatellite program will be mostly on, um, on supporting the Greek government in its uh, various needs. So as you can understand, uh, it will be more application oriented and I would say uh, more earth observation oriented. However, uh, we have been discussing with the ministry the possibility of having either uh, secondary payloads on these microsats that uh, could be uh, open to the scientific community, uh, both as a means of uh, scientific investigations, but also as a means of uh, um, educating uh, young engineers and uh, the younger young scientists, uh, and or uh, have a devoted line of uh, one CubeSat per year, which would, be, which would be really excellent if we could achieve it. So these are, these are possibilities, these, these are uh, open possibilities that uh, have been discussed, but I have to be absolutely honest, they have not been uh, confirmed, they have not been decided. So it is very important for us to know if there is interest from the community for such opportunities, for opportunities for secondary payloads on microsats or opportunities for cubesats. Uh, you also know that uh, there is a small experience in Greece with cubesats. Uh, we had the two cubesats launched uh, to the International Space Station in the past from uh, the University of Thrace and the University of Patras. Uh, but what we are now, uh, we, what we pursue for the future is to establish a line of CubeSats that would be very, very beneficial, both from the scientific point of view and from the educational point of view. And uh, now I would like to uh, ask uh, my dear uh, friend and colleague Vasilis Angelopoulos to share his experience with CubeSats. Uh, Vasilis uh, has the... Um, so to speak, the, the, double, the double experience of uh, having uh, coordinated a big space mission, a normal space mission. The theme is uh, mission of five uh, full grown satellites, so to speak, uh, but also a CubeSat, uh, one or two maybe, or one and a half CubeSat missions. Uh, so I would like uh, to ask Vasilis to share his experience on the difficulties, challenges, and also the merits of uh, investing effort in a CubeSat mission. Vasily, please. Thank you, Yanni. Uh, very nice to be in this forum. Very nice to hear everybody and their thoughts and get a closer view of uh, how ESA operates. 
it's uh, really interesting to me to see how um, it can actually manage to work with this kind of convoluted management structure. But be it as it may, I think this is what Chris has to live with. And the question is how to um, operate in this environment in a way that, in a, in a way that um, creates and sustains a long-term space program, both in terms of education and building capacity and in terms of technical abilities and uh, innovation. So these are the, th the th thoughts that uh, I'd like to hit uh, with uh, a few, few graphs. Um, and let me uh, just share my screen here. Um, so, um, so both in terms of exploration and in terms of uh, building capacity, which means really um, inspiring the young generation microsatellites have it and uh, can serve well building a national space program in that regard. Because humans are explorers, we're constantly looking to expand our horizons. We're driven by curiosity and in awe of the world's beauty, we try, strive to study and visit places far beyond our home. So satellites bring the wonders of space, the countless stars, the planets and the moons closer to us, thanks to our virtual eyes and ears probing how physics and how the universe works. So the more we can excite our kids and our students to participate hands-on in such exploration, the better we will all be for it. No matter where you look, astrophysics, Earth's climate, geology, urban planning, agriculture, commerce, marine biology, telecommunications, satellites will continue to have use and innovation in space technologies drives new directions in all these areas. Space science, which is my field, is no different. We study the Earth's space environment. We are motivated by uh, space weather. And uh, once space weather was of concern only to national security and to astronauts. But now space weather affects our society at large. We depend on space capital for communication, transportation, weather prediction, navigation, so protecting our assets, protecting our astronauts, and protecting our future space tourists requires a reliable space weather monitoring and forecasting system. The trouble is <clears throat> that how exactly the relevant particle energization you see pictorially here, starting from the sun and moving to the Earth's magnetosphere, how that energization happens within the near Earth space environment, the magnetosphere you see on the top right, how exactly it happens is very difficult to discern because the medium is vast, is dynamic. It requires fleets of satellites from dozens to hundreds. So like space weather stations revolutionized atmospheric science 100 years ago, small satellites and CubeSats in particular are bound to revolutionize space weather in the years to come. So therein lies the need for small satellites, scientific need, at least in this field, in, in this field but many other fields as well for similar reasons. Now beyond Earth, small satellites can expand the capabilities of flag speed, flagship missions and address cutting edge problems that could not be as effectively done from single large mission platforms. For example, studies of water ocean or magma ocean interiors at Jupiter's largest moons, say Ganymede, for example, or the interior composition of asteroids can be much more effectively done by a magnetically clean CubeSat than from a multi-purpose satellite that attempts to combine imaging and radar studies with magnetic sounding. So-called fractionated missions rely on a number of satellites with a variety of sizes to form a complete investigation. Examples include Baby Colombo to Mercury. That's a fractionated mission. Uh, a, an escapade, these are two microsites uh, soon going to Mars. Okay, so thanks to the um, thanks to the streamlined launch, launch services of um, uh, the CubeSat launch initiative, recently the last ten years that is, there have been many missions that have been flown, and the rate of their production, the rate of their successful launch, and uh, successful operations is accelerating. That's what you see in this chart here that was made four years ago to, this, to, to, to show an exponential growth 
in uh, launches of CubeSats. Universities, not just countries, can now jumpstart their own satellite programs. Small satellites allow more than cutting edge niche science to be done. They are disruptive innovators. They create a new market. They create a new value network. And they're bound to eventually displace established firms, products, and alliances, like the personal computer did, replace mainframes. One of their most important attributes is their quick development cycle, which spurs innovation. They're uniquely suited for starting a small country space program. So rightly so, Greece decided to go that way. In fact, not only are launch opportunities increasing, but more accurate orbit placement capabilities are increasing. So you can go after a specific target, no matter what the primary launch uh, is, uh, where the primary launch is taking you within reason and adjust by your own propulsion. This is the Sherpa ring that you see here in the middle, uh, carrying multiple payloads, and it's got its own propulsion system within to take the payloads to a different orbit from the primary. Moreover, at the bottom, you see CubeSat propulsion in the form of field emission electric propulsion that is now commercially available by this company, Impulsion, in uh, Austria, and is flight proven. So capabilities are increasing. Small satellites are uniquely suited also for the up and coming transformation of research universities. Now, when education is conducted hand in hand with research, it has the most value to the student and also the most value to their future employer. So an example of this such activity is that of my own team here at UCLA, which launched two satellites starting from next to nothing 10 years ago and trained 250 students from all disciplines. It cost about $3 million. It took about eight years to do, to build. It was launched in 2018. It's operating very well, uh, collecting lots of good data. Lots of papers are being written on it. There are many similar examples around in the US. So a national program need not start at a government agency, but can also start in parallel at universities. In fact, the constant influx of highly motivated students would guarantee the long-term success of the national program and can feed into both government organizations and into industry. So you need this for capacity building. You need this to inspire. You need this to create uh, capable engineers and scientists to populate uh, the ranks of such a program. And of course, uh, feed into industry. So the most important recipe to success in any program is a few people with experience and commitment to lead these efforts. These are to become the queens of their respective beehives. If we were to be talking to the person, controlling the purse strings here, I would say, think of your limited funds as seed funds to get a program going that will be to a good extent self-funded. A hundred million euros may sound a lot, but it goes by very fast. You need to build something that is sustainable. To initiate an R&D effort is the best way forward as a seed fund activity. Ensure success by attracting two or three individuals with demonstrative experience and commitment to lead such programs, probably in universities and, uh, and uh, industry and uh, the government. Target and focus on specific is opportunities that can bring in additional funds to make such a sustaining program. I'd say select two or three projects for inter internal development for proposal writing, like um, for the risk, uh, like the Fodoris effort that we heard about earlier, similar programs. If one doesn't make it, another will. And uh, target those opportunities that, uh, opportunities that I mentioned earlier, but let those come actually from the ground up from the community where the biggest interests are. And uh, if one is selected, of course, nurture it and use it as a training ground. So motivation and perseverance are necessary. It takes many tries to win. Usually the third time is the charm and many failed attempts to get the design right, but they are not sufficient. Motivation and perseverance are not sufficient. Design and implementation processes, which have been developed to increase the likelihood of success are hugely important too. It took tens of years to develop those um, 
you need to have experts who can understand what parts are to be obeyed and what part you can uh, you know gloss over and uh, what part you can judiciously apply and this experience is important to recognize when to implement implement those procedures efficiently without blowing the schedule or the cost or the spirit of the team so this takes us back to the top requirement to rely on a small number of experienced and committed people who have seen the end-to-end -end process have the vested interest to see such a program through. Uh, we know Ictinos and Calicratis, who built the Parthenon, or Bill Gates, who built Microsoft, or Jobs, built Apple, and so on. Any project could be successful, successful requires inspiring leaders and who are bestowed with name recognition and have the freedom to make decisions within, within a level playing field. This personnel choice would be, I think, the highest predictor of the program's success. So this is where I'd leave it and uh, maybe. Thank you, Vasily. Very thoughtful. And uh, we very much appreciate uh, you sharing your experience. Uh, all these points are very pertinent, of course. And uh, I have noted uh, one very critical word, uh, namely sustainability to have to build something that can be sustainable. That's of course very, very important uh, because only a sustainable uh, effort will have long-term uh, results, so to speak. Okay. Uh, I, I would then invite also Thodoris to uh, uh, say a few words, mainly on his, uh, on his Greek experience with uh, the CubeSat sent to ISS maybe, or uh, on another idea that he has been uh, working on for a Microsat uh, experiment. And then we can open the discussion uh, with regard to these small scale, so small scale efforts, which are uh, far from the big ESA missions or NASA missions, but still very useful uh, in especially in a national uh, in a national frame okay thank you yanni uh, so uh, vasily maybe you can just uh, click on stop uh, sharing okay thank you yeah, so the, the, um, uh, Vasilis uh, mentioned uh, uh, a few keywords. Uh, uh, one of them is uh, uh, capability build up and, and, and uh, uh, growing the uh, knowledge in, uh, uh, that is acquired uh, progressively in, in, um, uh, through uh, successive uh, uh, efforts. Uh, um, so uh, indeed, uh, Dufsat has uh, provided uh, a lot of experience in, in subsystems and uh, software and communicating with the satellite in various subsystems. Um, so I will show a few uh, slides on uh, um, follow up on or, or an, um, uh, a next uh, generation uh, CubeSat based uh, mission as, as um, developed here at the Democritus University. Uh, this is again uh, aiming to um, provide uh, uh, more uh, forum for discussion in the roundtable and, and, and some key uh, aspects, uh, again emphasizing uh, clear objectives, uh, demonstrating the concept of the measurement scheme and uh, demonstrating achieving the objectives and then uh, uh, demonstrating that the mission uh, itself can, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, the subsystems can can uh, uh, carry out um, uh, mission objectives and deliver uh, what's promised. So this uh, effort here is is um, uh, related to uh, a yet uh, uh, still open uh, question uh, relating again to. Uh, uh, energetic particles uh, flowing around the Earth's magnetosphere and uh, precipitating uh, in the atmosphere. And, and a key uh, aspect that's uh, yet unquantified or, or, or unresolved, its effects are, are effectively uh, unresolved, is the 
interaction of uh, uh, waves with energetic particles. Um, there's uh, a lot of uh, theoretical background and uh, uh, estimates, but the effect and the uh, effectiveness of the waves in, in, in uh, interacting with particles um, and uh, leading uh, to a loss in uh, uh, energetic electrons in the radiation bands. So the effectiveness of uh, waves to uh, uh, interact with particles and change uh, their energy and pitch angle is, is something uh, yet uh, unresolved. And the basic principle is that uh, as particles gyrate about the Earth's magnetic fields, uh, an, uh, a wave uh, can uh, uh, be in resonance and, and lead to a, a resonant uh, scattering, uh, energization and eventual precipitation um, uh, after this interaction into the atmosphere, essentially a mechanism to uh, deplete uh, uh, trapped population and, and cause them to precipitate. Um, as mentioned, uh, this is uh, unquantified and um, uh, uh, a mission that can be accomplished based on CubeSats is to investigate these processes via uh, active experiments. And, and the advantage of active experiments is that uh, you can have a completely controlled environment. Uh, in this case, uh, waves, the main, main concept is that waves can be uh, transmitted uh, by one satellite and, and then their effect can be uh, measured by another satellite uh, it's called the receiver here, but it's, it's essentially uh, a second satellite that measures the effects of these uh, wave particle interaction. Um, uh, th this concept uh, uh, was initiated uh, um, earlier, um, year, some years ago, uh, via discussions with uh, uh, Denis Papadopoulos. Um, uh, who's also an advocate of such active experiments. Uh, and uh, it has evolved uh, over the years to, to uh, mature into a concept that includes a, a transmitter-based uh, CubeSat that then uh, uh, has all the necessary subsystems to uh, generate uh, VLF waves at uh, uh, specific amplitudes and specific uh, energies, and then a receiver CubeSat that uh, via particle detectors may measures uh, the effects of these uh, uh, artificially generated waves on the particle population. So a demonstration of the energization and, and, and pitch angle scattering of uh, particles. And the advantage is that uh, one can measure a particle pro population uh, right before and right after uh, this energization, uh, this uh, interaction. Um, so the, uh, th there are um, uh, several uh, mature uh, ideas on, on uh, how one can produce these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, VLF waves and, of course, uh, uh, measuring energetic particles uh, on CubeSats uh, is uh, well established uh, by, by several very, very successful uh, CubeSat missions uh, in, in the recent years. Uh, and the key innovation here is the uh, transmission of uh, sufficient uh, waves of sub sufficient amplitude. And this um, can be uh, done in different ways. And, and, and Dennis Papadopoulos uh, and, and colleagues uh, have, have investigated uh, several uh, um, uh, concepts based either on ferrite based antennas. Uh, or uh, a very innovative idea to use the use of ferrofluids or, or um, uh, nano uh, magnets uh, behave as fluids um, to uh, generate these waves. So it's essentially here a rotating magnetic field is produced by a system of triaxial coils that align the nano magnets uh, in the uh, ferrofluid. Um, uh, a key part uh, uh, is, uh, again, as with, with uh, uh, Dedalus uh, shown earlier, to demonstrate uh, uh, achieving uh, the required objectives. So there's uh, extensive uh, ray tracing simulations that are taking place, uh, seeing how these uh, waves propagate uh, and what is uh, uh, their uh, uh, propagation amplitude uh, uh, dampening. Uh, in the uh, magnetosphere and then uh, simulating their effect on uh, particles. And via these simulations, we can uh, then go back and, and uh, um, uh, select the uh, appropriate properties of the uh, 
uh, nanocycle with the light, the transmitter and the, uh, the uh, particle detector. Um, and so uh, the, the status of this is that uh, there's a very um, uh, well-established theoretical background. The processes of where wave particle interaction are, are well-established uh, in, in, in literature by uh, many uh, studies. Um, generating uh, Whistler waves uh, uh, by rotating magnetic field sources, that's also uh, established. Um, and uh, there's a, a number of uh, simulations that are taking place that can be uh, feedback into the antenna parameterization. Um, uh, essential in, in proposing any mission concept is uh, uh, showing uh, exactly the parameters of, uh, of the subsystems that are, are, are needed. Um, and so is uh, selecting the optimal orbital configuration. And uh, that leads to the uh, specification of the uh, all the subsystems, and then that uh, definitely goes hand in hand with a viable uh, uh, cost estimate and schedule for delivering uh, the, the mission. Um, so uh, this uh, all um, needs to, um, yeah, it, it builds up from experience and, and, and the preliminary work and uh, also needs to feed into uh, simulations that uh, um, describe uh, all the, or, or uh, guide uh, the uh, subsystem uh, specification and eventually the uh, costing and the schedule. Um, so, um, yeah, going back to um, uh, the, uh, the need of uh, small size experiments is, is as Vasilis uh, uh, rightly pointed out, uh, putting together uh, uh, teams, uh, uh, students, and engineers that uh, work on a hands-on program, and then that expertise is, is uh, can can only go forward and be used elsewhere uh, in the uh, framework of Greece and below. Uh, many of our uh, students that originally worked in. Uh, uh, Duthsat uh, are now in uh, at uh, ESA uh, or uh, elsewhere in uh, space uh, uh, industry uh, in, in Europe. Uh, 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 several remain and work on uh, these concepts and, and in simulations, etc. So it's a it's, it's a, a definitely a way forward for uh, capacity and, and expertise uh, building. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Theodori. Thank you very much. So this is a very nice example of uh, uh, scientifically ambitious uh, small size experiment that uh, could in principle be implemented uh, on a CubeSat platform. And uh, this is, uh, I think that I want to, uh, I, I believe that uh, this could be a manageable, uh, an achievable national uh, space program, so to speak. I, I, I would not expect that Greece would ever, uh, well, not in the near future, be able to uh, build something bigger. But uh, on the CubeSat level, I believe that uh, we could pursue uh, scientifically mature and useful uh, missions. And uh, this, this was a very nice example. Thank you, uh, Thodori. So if there are any uh, comments, uh, please uh, feel free. I see, uh, okay, let me, I have to read here. Yeah, a comment by uh, our colleague uh, Nikos Solomos. The Hellenic Space Center should stand by the Greek teams participating in ESA initiatives. Uh, yes, of course. Of course, we absolutely agree. And this is uh, one of the reasons we have this meeting today. And there was also a comment by Hrisa, but I cannot see it. Sorry, I'm looking through the Achrisa of the Lidu. Uh, another point, apart from the support to train students, is the financial support to the Greek teams, which are members 
of missions, but they don't get paid by them. For example, Greek researchers who are collaborators or co eyes at NASA or JAXA missions, for example, by competitive project grants to cover the year. Yes, yes, I agree. We agree on that. Uh, it is one of our aims to be able to support. Um, well, I have to say that our primary aim is to support uh, a Greek, uh, a Greek mission uh, or a Greek participation to a Greek to a European mission. But uh, on a second level, yes, uh, we could of course consider uh, supporting Greek participation to other uh, missions. Vasilis, yeah. 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 yes, please, please, uh, Angele. Yeah, so I replied to Chris uh, and I said that this is indeed, potentially could be what you just uh, said. The way the program is structured in the US, when we want to participate in a mission that we don't have uh, a major instrument, you know, we will not part from the get-go. Uh, usually what we do is we talk to, to the people, say the European colleagues and say, do you need maybe a, an electronics board or uh, the detectors or, or optics. And then that is a smaller contribution, easier to manage, does not require a very high level approval across the agencies uh, exactly. But that allows us, if we win this competitive proposal, allows us to get onto the science working team, which is basically what you just say, you know, by participating in, in a mission, you wanna be at that level. Uh, so that you're involved in every uh, scientific sort of uh, discussion or, or decision or the planning of observations. And that then has the ramifications, right, for PhDs and, and that's how you can move forward. So it is an indirect, but not so indirect way, as long as the funding exists, because that funding has to come obviously, uh, in our case, from, our, from NASA, in, in that case, from Greece or from Prodex. So this is... Um, potentially a game changer too. It is easier to go about. That's right. All right. Uh, Nicolas Karnesis would like to uh, speak. Yeah, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hi, yeah, I, for the people that did not know me, I'm a postdoc at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. And we participate to the LISA mission. Uh, we're part of the consortium. And uh, just to, to continue to this previous discussion that uh, there is the hardware, there is also the software that people can contribute to. So if there is the no uh, great funding or let's say all the infrastructure for, for labs, for lab laboratories, one could contribute to the software, data analysis uh, procedures that uh, I guess new missions uh, give a lot of weight on these days. So that's, that's what I wanted to say. Indeed, uh, up to now, the Greek participation has been mostly on the scientific uh, mining. There are several uh, Greek colleagues who have been participating in uh, ESA missions and even on, on NASA missions uh, uh, with the capacity of the scientific co-investigator, which does not require uh, um, laboratories or um, collaboration with space industry or um, uh, national funding. Uh, many of us have been acting this way, that's true. And uh, they have been doing this on the expense of other uh, funding sources. So indeed, this is a way to participate, but uh, we believe that we should be a bit more ambitious than that. I mean, what we want to establish is really a participation on the hardware level. Uh, and uh, we want to aim for this. Um, we, at the same time, of course, we should not forget uh, all the other efforts. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Angelos for suggesting to have a kind of uh, decadal survey or some kind of <clears throat> national vision, yeah, on a small national scale, uh, just to have priorities because uh, uh, we have, 
we have many excellent scientists in Greece and uh, even more abroad probably. And uh, it's, uh, it would be very difficult to support everybody, but uh, then again, and uh, in every country there are competitive uh, programs and not everybody is uh, being supported by the National Space Agency. If I am not mistaken, uh, uh, Angele or Yanni, um, you may want to just to support what I'm saying. Yes, exactly. I mean, we, we have to, to do our own proposals and that's what, that's what we've been doing for the last few months. I've been coming up with mission design concepts in preparation for the decadal, but also uh, I want to also nudge the decadal towards the stuff that I like. <laughs> so there is that uh, effort, of course, trying to convince your, your fellow uh, scientists that they, you know, your ideas are good or, or not so good. Uh, and so that's um, part of the game. Um, you know, here from the, in the States, all our money comes from competitive. Uh, so that's for me, that's the normal. But I, without having a priority, I don't know how to, to make my plan for me and my, my team. I need to have priorities so that I can focus their energies the uh, most efficient way possible. Thank you, Thank you Angela. And also, uh, I think that it's important to align those to ESA's priorities. So that will be very helpful. And, and Angela, this is a great idea. Uh, and I would like to give an example here in France, every few years, our National Space Agency, CNES, organize a prospective seminar where all the science community involved in astronomy and space sciences, but also uh, sometimes uh, industry, are together and they make proposals and then there is a, a long term, some equivalent of the decadal survey that's established for the long term. And then for these participations in space missions against through competitive selections, there are, uh, 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 it can be funded for participating in the hardware, but of course this is sometimes substantial amount, but also uh, 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 as was mentioned earlier, you can get supported for uh, participating as, as a science choir, just some small amounts in order to, to, to do your research, go to Congress and things like that. So this is a procedure that CNES is organizing and supervising this, uh, the prospective uh, seminar? Yes, it's a prospective seminar that's organized every, every, every few years. And uh, uh, usually organization starts one year ahead. There are working groups that are defined in, in order to, uh, uh, to, to prepare the seminar. And then there are proposals that, so it's uh, the, the, the broad lines, the guidelines that are established in this prospective seminar. Okay, Yanni, uh, maybe we could speak about this. Uh, I, I do not want to continue now because maybe there are some other questions. But uh, I, I would be very interested to know some more details about uh, this procedure that CNES is applying. Okay, so are there any other comments or questions to our uh, panelists or even to uh, other colleagues here? I don't see anything else. Okay. I think that uh, it seems that there, ah, there is one new message. Uh, were there cases where Greece's science tech interests have been reflected in ESA strategic programs since our ESA membership? Uh, well, this is uh, difficult to answer because uh, uh, how would you, I am not aware of any uh, Greek-led uh, science proposal or tech proposal to the ESA uh, broad calls. I know of uh, colleagues who have participated in, uh, in various proposals for cosmic vision, for example. Uh, there are some of them are here, like Tassos Anastasiadis, or myself, or I'm sure there are other, or uh, 
for example, also Vasilis Karmandaris, or I think also Manuelis Xiluri. So many of us have been participating in the past to um, proposals in the framework of uh, the ESA strategic program. But uh, as far as I know, we were participating in uh, proposals that were led uh, by some uh, non-Greek colleagues. I am not aware of any Greek-led proposal. So uh, this is something uh, I am not in the position to answer. But uh, I think that it would it is time maybe for us to take the lead, uh, just like uh, Thodoris Saris. Uh, I, I mean, this was an achievement because he took the lead and gathered an international team and prepared a proposal that was very successful. So he shows the way. I think we should go for it. Just go for it. Okay, so thank you very much. Many thanks to the to the panelists, to the member of to the members of the panel. Thank you very much for your time and effort to uh, bring your your exper your experience, your expertise, your ideas to uh, our fellow scientists. I hope that this uh, roundtable was uh, inspiring, somehow inspiring, useful, interesting, especially for the younger scientists, because uh, we want to encourage the young generation to go forward, to try to, try, uh, to participate, to try to lead and uh, to excel in the international uh, scene, right? I mean, we this is an international game. We are talking about national programs, but it is an international game. So uh, thanks everybody, also to the uh, attendants, to the participants. And uh, please feel free to uh, send uh, questions or suggestions. Uh, I just want to repeat the Hellenic Space Center is very young. We are still struggling to define uh, our, uh, our way forward. And we are here to help the community. I mean, we are not here for ourselves. We are here for the community. Uh, so again, thank you very much and uh, have a nice evening, everybody.